Welcome to Preservation Perspectives, the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation podcast. Today, we're talking to Josephine Talamantes. She is the founder and board chair of the Chicano Park Museum and Cultural Center in San Diego, California. The museum just opened on Saturday, October 8th, after many, many years of planning. Welcome, Josie. Welcome. It's great to be here. Thank you. Uh, your website says the museum a aims to educate individuals about Chicano and indigenous culture and history. You know, we host a variety of fun educational classes and activities for the public involving a wide range of arts, literature, science, and history. You know, let's start off right there. Um, you know, why, why is it important to preserve the Chicano Park and the history of Chicano and indigenous culture and history in your area? I think Chicano Park is symbolic of a community's effort at self-determination. Um, in this community, we were about 20,000 strong. And then the Interstate 5 came through and the California 75, which is the Coronado San Diego Bridge, and wiped out three-fourths of our community. Uh, we went from 20,000 down to less than 5,000 in less than 14 years without a public input process. So Chicano Park is significant because it was at that point that the community had begun asking for a park. There's very, very little green space in this area. So um, what we learned was that the we were promised a park to maintain a sense of semblance uh, of community. However, when we saw them leveling the land, um, one of our colleagues, Mario Solis, may he rest in peace, asked the workers if they were finally going to build our park. And they said, no, they were building a California Highway Patrol station. Mm -hmm. Well, at that point, Mario ran through the community to the business leaders, to the local residential leaders, and up to San Diego City College, where I was at the time. And we came down and we stood up in self-determination and stopped the bulldozers and began creating our own park. So that is significant for this community to realize that after years and years of neglect, an effort by the community to build their own park was what we needed in order to stand up. Being San Diego is on the border, it's very difficult. And it's a, it at the time was very conservative. So um, I hate to say this, but I think the powers that be really didn't have much regard for my community. And when they saw us stand up and create our own park, it changed the, the dynamics all the way around, politically, socially, um, emotionally, spiritually. So it's important for the next generation to really visit the museum and learn their history and learn that they can take ownership um, by uh, really recognizing their own, their own self-determination and effort to build their community. And I think that's necessary, especially with the influx of so many um, Central Americans coming into this area. We really want them to start preserving their history and their stories as well. Um, from my perspective, I just don't want them growing up in the same environment that I grew up in, uh, which was very conservative, um, very um, uh, lack of regard and 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 just a feeling of of not fitting in on the border you know we have i have relatives on both sides of the border but when i go to tijuana or ensenada or on the other side of the border i'd be called you know different names derogatory names because i lived on this side of the border mm -hmm. and then over here i was defined as a hyphenated you know, Mexican American, not just an American, even though my family's been here since 1906. Uh, my mother was born here in 1914. I mean, it's a lot of history that I'm just kind of laying on you, but I think the significance of preserving a museum and cultural center really relies on the efforts that it took to establish Chicano Park. And that was the community saying, we're not gonna stand here and just be decimated continue to be decimated. Um, we're going to define for ourselves. And ironically, that effort took place on the founding of National Earth Day, <laughs> which is so funny because 
here the nation was celebrating, you know, the establishment of Earth Day and green space, and we in San Diego were facing jail time. <laughs> mm. <laughs> well, it's it's such a um, compelling and interesting background and story, uh, which you also tell very effectively on on your website. And I would encourage um, those in our audience to to read more. Um, but but I wanted to say um, by by way of following up, you know, some in our audience might not be aware that Chicano Park contains the world's largest collection of outdoor murals. Yes. And so, uh, you know, so uh, that being the case, what's, what is the status of the murals today? Well, we have, depending on how you count a mural, I mean, it, you know, you have to realize these are on pylons and abutments and, you know, pillars. So if a, if a mural is facing you and it's only on that side right there, that's one mural. If the mural incorporates all four sides of that of that pillar, that's one mural. If the mural has a, a mural in the front, on the side, in the back, and on the other side, that's four murals. So just to understand that dynamic, we have more than 108 uh, murals in our park, and um, it's important to recognize that this is the largest collection of Chicano murals in the world. And, you know, following up on that point, you know, for those not familiar with Chicano Park or with with murals in general, what what are the kinds of stories they tell? Because these the they're more than art. I mean, these are oh, no. these are they're, rich stories that are being told. Yes, they're educational pieces. You know, prior to the Internet, um, the murals, artwork were our expressions that was pretty much our what did they call it back then super information highway <laughs> you know you wanted to get the word out you made you know seriograph posters or murals um the content of our murals um really is a story of really neglect in this community in the 1950s um um well, it should be known that this this community was segregated, and I use that word uh, I use that word because it's important to recognize through um, redlining we couldn't live anywhere else, and I didn't know that you know <laughs> naively when I was doing the research to get Chicano Park and the monumental murals listed on the National Register of Historic Places, I found out that we were redlined. We couldn't live anywhere else until 1954 when Dr. J.J. Uh, Kimbrough uh, actually helped overturn that law. So I think that's that's significant to understand right then and there is that you have a community that was experiencing extreme neglect and the community standing up um, to, to tell our own stories. And that's where the artists came in and began narrating what was going on. We had, um, in the 50s, they rezoned us to light industry, which meant that toxic businesses could move in right next to your home, or they could be right next to the elementary school. And that's what was happening. And so the community was really incensed that these toxic, toxic businesses um, were coming into the environment and began protesting um, these toxic businesses. We're, we're sandwiched in by the Interstate 5, and then you have the Navy and shipbuilding industry. And so the pollution in this area is, for the state of California, according to California Environmental Health Protection Agency, we are the third worst air polluted area in the state of California. And so it's important to know that when we started fighting against these toxic businesses, that's when the artists came in and began documenting our stories. So you have one mural that says, Yonkis si, or Barrios si, Yonkis no. So Barrios means the community, yes, and junkyards, no. Mm -hmm. So you have a lot of in, you know, statements in those murals. Um, uh, the, the most, well, the second most recent one, the Horacio Rojas Hernandez mural is about a, a, a gentleman that was coming across the border and didn't speak English very well. And he was told to um, turn over his bottle of water. Well, he didn't understand that. And so he responded the way you respond at an airport. He opened the top and started pouring the water out. Unfortunately, the border patrol 
really, they tased him to death. They tased him and beat him to death for that. And so that story is in a mural that's seven stories tall. And recently on NPR, we learned that that case is finally going to court. So the murals are, are, are symbolic, but yet the messages are contemporary and reflect what we've had to engage in this community. So um, I would think that's really important to know. And the last thing I'll say is that we're right now embarking upon a process to uh, renovate the murals. We're going back to the most historic ones and we're uh, doing an assessment on which murals need to be restored. They will not be changed, but they'll be restored to the vibrancy they were when they were first painted. Well, we, you, you've shared some of your background as well as the background of your community, but how did how did the, the idea for a museum come about? <laughs> well, that's an interesting one. This idea has been around since about 1979. I was the director of the Centro Cultural de la Raza in Balboa Park. And at that time, um, Pete Wilson was the mayor and he was uh, issuing a two-year phase out of the Centro because he didn't feel that that our cultural values were as significant as the other museums and cultural centers in Balboa Park. Um, there was also an organization there, that, an organization of museums, and they weren't all keen on including us, even though we were in the park. So at that point, I began researching um, the concept of turning the Centro into a museum. And so I began, you know, visiting museums and, and, and really looking at collections and things of that nature. But at the time, the Centro really wasn't ready. And, but I kept that in the back of our mind. And so the facility that we're in right now was the initial facility that it was identified to become the um, a highway patrol station. Uh, when we negotiated Chicano Park in April 22nd, 1970, uh, we occupied the land for 12 days and we negotiated the footprint of the plant included the facility. And we thought that was important because we needed social services. So it became a social service, service agency and then it became adult and continuing education. And we stayed in the facility at the time, we meaning the Chicano Park Steering Committee of which I was also a co-founder, uh, um, and they were founded to negotiate on behalf of Chicano Park. Um, we we weren't ready. We weren't ready at the time, but we were promised in our negotiations that as soon as they built a facility for adult and continuing education, that the facility would come back to us. When I learned that the that they were finally building the facility, we just didn't know it was going to take 35 years. <laughs> For them to build a building and people were dying left and right along the way. But when I learned that they were finally building the facility for adult and continuing education, I immediately began frequenting the real estate assets department and the mayor of San Diego to, to solidify the commitment that they had made to the community. Hmm. And at that point, uh, I began uh, the negotiations of, I think we had just been listed as a, a national, listed on the national register, but myself and another co, uh, co-author, uh, Ma uh, Dr. Manny Galaviz, we co-authored the landmark status. So while we were co-authoring co the landmark status, I also put in place the articles of incorporation for the Chicago Park Museum and Cultural Center. And I, I completed that in 2015. Uh, landmark status was granted in December of 2016. And then the following year, we began doing programming. Even though we didn't have a facility, we began doing programming in, in the surrounding area. So there's another cultural center called the Bread and Salt. We used the library. And then eventually we had a partnership with the University of San Diego by which we uh, created an RV bus uh, which is a mobile classroom that we got it and we do exhibition in in the in the bus and then we go to surrounding communities in this neighborhood right here there is no high school there never has been a high school there is a proposed high school being built right now that's part of an educational com complex that'll be from K through 12 but it's not built yet so we've used the bus 
uh, to go around to different schools to do training and education. And we've been programming since. So it's it's a long answer to a short question, but that that's the trajectory of what happened <laughs> and why we became Chicano Park Museum and Cultural Center. Once we became a landmark status and, and the influx of international visitors, we knew that we needed some mechanism to, uh, like a visitor center, if you will. Uh, but we didn't necessarily want to focus on a visitor center, and that's why we developed it as the Chicano Park Museum and Cultural Center. So in our opening last, uh, about two weeks ago, we have an exhibition of pillars, um, stories of resilience and self-determination. And those are the organizations and groups that have worked with us since the founding of Chicano Park. And then we took the vision of Salvador uh, Roberto Torres, who's uh, now in his mid eighties. And we displayed an installation of his vision from the 1970s. So it's a beautiful exhibition. The, the museum is serving the community. We have, uh, we open Fridays, Saturdays and Sundays uh, to the public. And next year, we'll probably increase those days. But right now, we're working towards hiring staff and bringing on um, organizers for the volunteers that have been working with us. So it, it's a long, it's been a long process, but we're happy. Our board, you can see in my background here, our board is more than excited. And we are um, really doing some good things in this community. Uh, uh, at the opening we had to stagger it because you just don't let everybody in at one time. And the lines were very, very long mm. and no one was complaining. No one was upset. They were enjoying the murals outside. We, we activated the, the, the kiosk, which is our stage. And we did a lot of programming outside while people were waiting to get in. We had more than 2000 visitors. Wow. Mm. So well, it, was, it, was, it was a very long road for you to get to this point. And I, I think, um, as I was listening to you, uh, I, it occurred to me, I think a lot of people would have given up <laughs> at some point because you face so many hurdles and resistance and COVID and finances. Oh, COVID. Oh, COVID. Um, and and I, I hope as you do hire staff and build out, um, you're thinking about an oral history project. Oh, we're already that doing that. We're already yeah. doing that. Uh, the first uh, program we did in 2016 we invited um, a woman from, it's an organization that's affiliated with the libraries, but she brought her her scanner. And then we set, set up a separate room to do video uh, interviews. And then we solicited the community to come for this event and ask them to bring photographs and be ready to be interviewed if they wanted to. So every program we've done since 2016 have been collecting oral histories along the way. And more than anything else, I can tell you right now that <clears throat> uh, so we have um, we were granted a small award from the University of Houston. I think it's called the United States Latino Digital Digital Humanities, by which we were able to uh, work with a local um, archivist, Tommy Camarillo. She was the the chairperson of the Chicano Park Steering Committee probably for about 30 years. But she had begun collecting um, articles about Chicano Park or the, the neighborhood, Logan Heights, for 52 years. Her house looks like a museum. And with this small grant, we were able to uh, begin digitally um, scanning parts of her collection. We started with the posters of Chicano Park, but we're expanding now. And we have an archival um, section in the museum that only focuses on her on her uh, collection. And it's just amazing what she has. Uh, universities around the area have been soliciting her for, air, for, for years that they want her collection. And she said, nope, she wants it to remain in the community. So she's working with us to digitize it and to um, get it into asset-free boxes and sleeves, mm. et cetera. And there's another old library about four blocks from where, where we're at right now. And we're looking to possibly obtain that because the amount of people that are calling with their own, you know, historical records and collections and things of that nature, we know right now we do not have enough space in our museum. And we have close to 11,000 square feet. Wow. Um, 
we don't have enough room. So we're trying to solicit this other uh, facility that will just be pretty much the Logan Heights archive is what we're talking about because it serves this, the complete area, but it'll be uh, an offshoot of the Chicano Park Museum and Cultural Center. So well, we're, we're working on all levels. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and you've just opened officially and you've already outgrown your space. <laughs> Isn't that funny? <laughs> Um, so for our audience, um, take a moment and describe the visitor experience for someone interested. Uh, what is it like? Take us through what, what they can see and do uh, on your site. Well, not on our on our website or when they come to the museum. And, and for those, uh, the, the visitor experience in person. But but also, I guess, how your, how your website might also serve as an extension of the visitor experience. Well, you have to realize there's two separate organizations. One is the Chicano Park Museum and Cultural Center, and the other one is the Chicano Park Steering Committee. And the Steering Committee are stewards of Chicano Park. But many members of the steering committee are also on our board, so we interact very closely. Your experience getting to Chicano Park is probably, it's probably the most eye-opening experience you'll have. I mean, it, it's not unusual where we have tour buses that come through and their mouths are just open because they're walking through the park and there are all these beautiful, beautiful murals. And then they come into the museum. And once they come into the museum, then they see our permanent collection because we already have a growing permanent collection. And then they can come into the exhibition space unless we're doing programming. And we've done that. We've had artist symposiums in, in, in one of our rooms there where artists uh, that have painted in the park. In fact, we did this on the opening. Artists that are painting in the park will had half hour slots and they were showing their slides and talking about their work. The exhibition itself, uh, is made up of 12 separate pillars. We brought an artist, um, uh, Nicholas, Nicholas um, Aguilar and Jazz Garcia. They built us kind of six foot pillars that we have. And they, um, they put them together. They have rollers on the feet. And, and so we have identified 12. The first one is the Kumeyaay, of course, because that's the land we live on. And we have historical records that show that Kumeyaay had their villages not two blocks from where the museum is located, and also down along the bay where the naval where the naval station is now on 32nd. And so we we have the first pillar, which is the Kumeyaay. The second pillar, of course, is the Chicano Park Steering Committee because they've been the stewards of the park. And then we deviate there because we have working with the steering committee a youth group that's called the Aslan Youth Brigade. And they're just young people that, that really want to help and support the park. So each of these groups, um, um, the other 12 pillars are the Centro Cultural de la Raza, which is uh, in Balboa Park. Then we have um, uh, Aztec dance or Chichimeca dance and Tolteca dance. And then we have a pillar on Danza Folklorica, we have a pillar on Our Lady of Guadalupe Church, which it was the church in this area. Uh, we don't have a church in this area that we uh, that we frequent because the Interstate Five separated us. And then we have the Lowrider Council, um, and then we have uh, music, musica, and we have teatro, and we have another organization that's called Union del Barrio. All of these organizations and groups have been with. Chicano Park and supported it from the inception. If it was the dancers coming out and dancing, if it was musicians coming out and singing, uh, of course we had um, the Chicano Park um, ballet, ballet, which is created by Ramon Chucky Sanchez, who is a, who was, he, may he rest in peace, was a National Heritage Fellow. Um, so each of the pillars kind of tells the story of their experience of who they are. We curated the show, uh, myself, um, Valerie Jaimes, and Dr. Pulido. Uh, we curated the show, but we allowed each of those groups and organizations to uh, tell their own story, if you will. So you walk in through these pillars, and then we have a screen that kind of rolls down interviews of each of the groups and them talking about their work. And then we have a, a, a large uh, installation of 
um, Salvador Roberto Chavez, uh, uh, Torres is uh, his view. And I have to mention this because he's a contemporary of of Chicano artists, um, Jose Montoya, Esteban Villa from the internationally recognized Royal Chicano Air Force, from Rene Yanez and Ralph Madrigal um, from Galeria de la Raza in San Francisco. These, these were kind of entrepreneurs in the art field back in the fifth, late 50s, early 60s. And it was a time when our community, I mean, we, you know, we didn't encourage our community to become artists. We encouraged them to become uh, good citizens and good workers so that they could help support their family. But these these artists were in the late, you know, the beat era, if you will, in the Bay Area, going to College of uh, Arts and Crafts in Oakland. And, you know, he was instrumental in um, a lot of visionary things, even at that time. So in the Bay Area, there were these wooden sculptures that he helped create, um, and they're still there today. So he came back to San Diego, and then he had this vision of what we were going to do once they started taking our property through eminent domain. He lo His father lost his house, and he was so upset by it that he just, he hated the talk of, of the Coronado Bay Bridge until he started looking at the pillars, looking at the land, and then he started drawing and he started these visions of what it could look like. And so he's kind of the visionary of all the murals. And when Victor Ochoa um, established the mural marathon in 1973, him and Roberto Ch uh, Torres put the call out to all these artists throughout the Southwest that came and began painting in the park. So it's, you know, his, his vision is pretty condense and and forward thinking and it was from the 1970s and so we thought we needed to really put his vision out there so that people could uh, see the work that he was doing at that time that's still impacting today because of all those that I've mentioned he's the only one still alive from that era. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I always like to conclude these podcasts with a call to action for our audience. Um, and so where can people go online to learn more about you? Um, how can they get involved and how can they come visit you? Well, they can come visit, just come to Chicano Park uh, Friday, Saturday and Sunday. Our exhibitions are open to the public uh, from noon to six daily. And then uh, our website is www.chicanoparkmuseum.org. You can go to our website and you can see uh, all the oral histories that we began collecting even before we had the museum. Um, and the call to action would be really to support local historians, local archivists um, that are really documenting their communities. You know, a lot of times we kind of refer to the academics to do that. But in the case of Tomasa Camarillo, a woman that has been collecting for 52 years, has a collection that is being sought out by every university that sees what she has. And when I asked her one day, why did, why did you start doing this? And her answer was, every time we had to fight for Chicano Park at the city or at the county or for the state, I had to have documentation. So I began creating these binders of documentation. And so we have an extensive collection and the call out is to support your local archivist, support your local historian, support your local person collecting oral histories because it is history in contemporary time that serves our next generations. Hmm. I could not say that better myself. In fact, I, I need to bring you to my classroom to tell my students that. <laughs> So it uh, sounds just outstanding, all, all the work that you're doing. So I, I just want to say uh, thank you again, uh, Josie Talamantez, for being our guest. Thank you. Uh, be, uh, be sure to follow the ACHP on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and YouTube to keep up with the latest in historic preservation news. I'm Luke Nichter. Thank you for joining us on Preservation Perspectives. Thank you, Luke. Have a good day.